Christ is risen. Okay, I told you last year I was going to do this again this year. I told you there would be a pop quiz a year ago. You don't remember? I was going to say Christ is risen, and your response is he is risen indeed. So let's try it again. And fair warning, next year, <laughs> I'm going to do it again. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter. I am so glad you are all here. I'm glad that those of you are at home or watching us online. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Mark chapter 16. And as you're turning there, I invite you to come back next week when I will be kicking off a new series on mental health. I'll be taking several weeks to work through some of the common misconceptions some Christians have when dealing with mental health problems. I'll also be sharing some ways that we as a church can better support one another when we face mental health challenges. And these days, I don't know about your experience, but my experience is it's not a matter of if I or you will face a mental health challenge, it is a matter of when. I really believe this can be an important series for our church over the next month or so. But that begins next week. That's next week. This week, we are in Mark chapter 16. So let's begin reading in verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said, Nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Mark is a master of surprise. But the big surprise here in this passage is not Jesus' resurrection. He had predicted that no less than four times earlier in the gospel. I'm going to need some help with slides. I'm, they're not advancing for me, please. Let's go to that next slide. He had announced it no less than four times earlier in the gospel. That's not the surprise. Nor is the surprise that he's going to give his failed disciples a chance to meet him back in Galilee. He told them he was going to do that in Mark chapter 14. No, the big surprise in this passage is how the women respond to the news that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Next slide, please. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. I can't prove this scientifically, 
But my assumption is this is the least read account of Jesus' resurrection in churches on Easter Sunday. In fact, this may be the first and only sermon, Easter sermon, you hear from this passage ever. And now is as good a time as any to point out to you a note you have in your Bibles just after verse 8. If we go to the next slide, that note likely says something like the earliest manuscripts don't have verses 9 through 20. And what that means is the consensus among textual scholars is that verses 9 through 20 aren't part of the original story Mark is telling in his gospel. Mark's gospel, the earliest copies we have, end after verse 8. Now, it may be that Mark wrote a longer ending to his gospel, but it was lost somewhere along the way. A piece of scroll was broken off, and it was forever lost to history. It's also possible, though, that Mark, ever the crafty storyteller, intentionally ends his gospel after verse 8 with an abrupt cliffhanger. They were afraid. And if that's the case, you can see why decades later, somebody came along and said, no, 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 no. We're going to have to write a longer ending. We've got to finish this story. We can't let people be living with that kind of suspense. What happened? What happened? Tell the rest of the story, Mark. Now, for our purposes today, I'm going to assume that Mark intentionally ended his gospel this way. And even if he didn't, It is still providentially the best ending we have. But even so, come on. It doesn't really fit with the Easter vibe, does it? They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Is this really the text we want to be reading on Easter Sunday when more people than usual come to church to hear some good news? I don't know. I guess it depends on how afraid we are. Go to the next slide. The women's response is a surprise. Mostly because Mark has set us up to expect a bit more from them. At the end of chapter 15, after Jesus dies, Mark tells us that these women did not abandon Jesus the way the male disciples did. They are there watching the crucifixion from afar. And after he dies, At least some of them stay around long enough to see where Joseph of Arimathea takes Jesus' body. That's how they know where to go on the first day of the week. And it's to these women that Jesus, through the young man at the empty tomb, entrusts with the message of resurrection. And it's to these women, faithful to Jesus to the end, that Jesus gives the message to be delivered to the other disciples, that he wants to meet them back in Galilee. Earlier in Mark's gospel, when Jesus heals someone, he normally tells them, be quiet about this. Don't tell anyone what I've done for you. And they almost always disobey Jesus. And they go and tell everyone, So that large crowds are always hunting Jesus, always pressing in upon him throughout his ministry. Because people cannot keep quiet about the good thing Jesus has done for them. But now, when these women are told, go and tell, spread the word, they do the opposite and run away and remain silent. Now, 
they let their fear, at least initially, get the best of them. Just like all the other disciples did. Fear plays a prominent role in Mark's gospel. It's one of the primary forms of resistance that erects barriers and obstacles to Jesus' mission. We see it repeatedly. In Mark chapter 5, after Jesus cast a legion of demons out of a tortured man, his neighbors begged Jesus to leave their region and to leave them alone because they are afraid. And in Mark 11, the religious leaders resolve once and for all to kill Jesus because when they see how popular he is with the people, they are afraid. And of course, when Jesus is arrested, Peter and the other disciples desert and deny him because they are afraid. And now these women, faithful till the end, flee the empty tomb and tell no one because they are afraid. Mark's abrupt cliffhanger ending leaves us with a nagging question. Is fear going to get the final word in this story? Is fear bigger, more powerful than the resurrection? And the answer is, well, it depends. It doesn't depend on what the women do. And it doesn't depend on whether the disciples rendezvoused with Jesus back in Galilee. We know, we know that eventually the women shared the good news with others. And we know that the disciples took advantage of the second chance Jesus offered them. We wouldn't be here if they hadn't. And the question is not did they overcome their fear and meet Jesus in Galilee? The question this cliffhanger ending poses to us is, are we going to overcome our fear? Do we have the courage to meet the risen Christ back in Galilee? What happens next in this story on this Easter Sunday is up to us. Mark leaves the ending in our hands. What will we do? How will we respond? The resurrection is an announcement of good news, but it's also an invitation. And actually, invitation is not a strong enough word. The resurrection is an announcement of good news, and it is a summons. We're here today to celebrate the good news that Jesus is alive, the tomb is empty, death is defeated. That means that death does not get the final word over Jesus. And nor does it get the final word over us. That's good news. It's worth celebrating. But the message from the young man at the empty tomb is also an invitation. No, it's a summons to meet the risen Christ back in Galilee. Now, why Galilee? Why would Jesus want to meet his original disciples back in Galilee? And what does it mean for us to meet Jesus today back in Galilee? Well, Galilee was the place where Jesus began his ministry of announcing the kingdom of God. It's where it all started. Galilee is where Jesus called his first disciples to follow him as they were fishing or collecting taxes or whatever else they were doing. Galilee was the place where they first said yes to Jesus, even though they did not understand what they were getting into. But now, they do. And to say Jesus is inviting them and us back to Galilee 
is to say that he's calling us back, summoning us back to the beginning, to the start, so we can begin again with him. Only this time, he wants us to really listen to him. Just what the Father's voice said to do in the Mount of Trans- Transfiguration. Listen to him. He wants us to really listen to him this time because we didn't the first time. Listen to him and actually do what he says. Deny ourselves and take up our crosses and pursue greatness by serving others. This time, he wants us to start over in Galilee and follow his example. Love the way he loved. Treat others the way he did. He wants us to follow his example because that's what disciples do. And the summons is in itself an announcement of good news. So when the risen Christ summons us back to Galilee, it means that no matter how badly we have failed, no matter how badly we have failed, Christ has not given up on us. He still has a plan, still has a purpose, still wants to use us, all of us, including our failures and our mistakes, to share the good news and make a difference in this dark world. I love how the young man at the empty tomb singles out Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter, who denied Jesus three times the night he was arrested, Go tell the disciples and Peter. Oh, especially Peter. You're probably going to have to walk up and get in front of him, put your hand on his shoulders. Say, Peter, look at me. Jesus is alive. And he's waiting for you in Galilee. You may have come here to this place today to hear that. Jesus is alive, and he's waiting for you. For you. He's waiting for you in Galilee. You can go back to the start and begin again. Now, the women's response shows us that the resurrection, even stepping into the empty tomb, does not inject instant courage into our system. It does not immediately fortify our faith. There will always be a tension. There will be a struggle between fear and faith, which gives birth to courage until we see Jesus face to face. And until then, Mark's cliffhanger ending challenges us to manage our fear. and in particularly courageous moments, to let go of our fear. To let go of our fear of rejection that keeps us from seeking out someone who desperately needs a word of hope and encouragement today. Or our fear of how Christ is responding to our latest failure. Or our fear of failing again or our fear of what others will think of us when we tell them that our primary allegiance is to Christ above all others. 
or our fear of what outrageous thing the risen Christ may call us to do when we go back to Galilee and surrender ourselves to him. And of course, our fear of death, which keeps us from really living. Does fear get the last word in this story? Is fear bigger, more powerful than Jesus' resurrection? We do not need Mark to tell us the answer to those questions. Not when we have the opportunity to answer them with our lives. So may we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, and all that it entails, including the opportunity to go back to Galilee and rededicate ourselves to following him, rededicate ourselves to following the risen Christ who gives us another chance. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you bolster our faith today amidst the fears that swirl about. I ask that those of us who can so easily identify with the women who can't comprehend, can't understand, can't do anything but run away in stunned silence, that you would strengthen our hearts and open our mouths that we might declare the good news. And I ask that for those of us who barely made it here today because we're so ashamed, so ashamed of our failures, that you would give us the courage to make our way back to Galilee where we can begin again and start over with you. And it's in the name of Jesus, our risen Lord, we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Raise a